But the fact that we all forget is that without the number zero, you cannot go to number 10, right? So we don't generally like uh, to tell zero as a number. We always say from one to nine. But uh, the fact we have to realize is without putting zero, you cannot move on. So what zero does is zero gives infinite possibilities to all the numbers from one to nine. Now, you may be wondering why I'm telling this in this root canal anatomy uh, presentation. So I would like to compare zero as root canal anatomy and number one to nine as the various steps in root canal treatment. Now, what I realized over a period of time is people, researchers, clinicians, and academicians are focusing more on steps of RCT from access opening to irrigation to post and rhombic filling, but they are not uh, properly understand the impact of root canal anatomy. So the influence of zero from numbers one, from one to nine is uncomparable because the moment you add zero, that gives infinite possibilities. So likewise, Root canal anatomy is a core foundation for all the research in endodontics. So the moment you understand root canal anatomy, all the steps from access opening to post endodontic filling will come with much ease. So that's the first thing which I would like to convey to you all. So moving on to the presentation, what's the speciality of root canal anatomy? So I would say it is special by two means. Number one, it is complex. Number two, it is dynamic. Now, let's discuss the first factor, which is dynamic. Why it is called dynamic? It is called dynamic because the root canal anatomy will change over time. Let me tell, give you a few examples. You can see in this radiograph, the first molar, lower molar, this uh, radiograph is uh, for a patient somewhere close to around 20 years of age. So you can see here that, um, Dr. Tarun, can you see the pointer here? Can someone answer that? Pointer, yeah, pointer, yes, it's visible. We yeah. can see the cursor, we can see the oh. cursor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can see in this radiograph, this is the distal root root and this is the mesial root. For a 20 year old uh, patient, you can see the distal root canal is large. It's very bulbous. Okay. And mesially, if you look again, you can see a canal all the way from the orifice to the root apex and which is not differentiated properly. Now, if you take a mandibular first molar for a patient somewhere close to around 50, you can see something like this. Now here you can see on contrary with the first x-ray, you can see the distal root canal is slightly narrow and the mesial had differentiated for, to mesiobuccal and mesioling. But when you go to uh, a patient more than 60 plus, you can see there is uh, severe attrition and uh, there is hardly, vis there is any uh, pulp chamber that is visible. In addition, the distal canal and mesial canal also is not visible properly. So this radiograph highlights the fact that root canal anatomy is dynamic. That means it changes over time. Okay, so that is mean by that you mean by dynamicity of root canal anatomy. Second is the complexity. So why it is complex? It is because it have primary canals, it have lateral canals. Apical delta, isthmus, curvatures, development anomaly, flattened canals, and dentinal tubules. So all these eight factors are making the root canal anatomy complex. So let's discuss each of these factors, eight factors, very briefly, because I don't have much time to elaborate on all these factors. So let's discuss the primary factor. So these are my own cases all eight canals, seven canals, uh, C-shaped canals, which I had done long back, obturating all the primary canals. You can see in this picture. 
Let's move on. If you look, this is a lateral incisor, which have been uh, said during my introduction. This is the lateral incisor of four root canal system. All are primary root canal, well obturated. And both these cases, the, the seven canals and the lateral canal case was published in the cover image of Journal of Endodontics and International Endodontic Journal of that year. Now, which tooth have the maximum endodontic failure? If you ask this question to uh, someone, many people think that the maximum endodontic failure can happen towards maxillary molar or mandibular molar or third molar. Now, what you should understand is the most common endodontic failure or maximum endodontic failure happens with the mandibular premolars, preferably the first premolars. You know why? Because the root canal anatomy of this tooth is very tricky and that's why it is called the enigmatous tooth. Here you can see it starts like a single canal and when it reaches at the middle third, it bifurcates into two, three, four, or even five root canal system. This is the micro CT image of the same. You can see single canal branching into three, four, or five at the middle third or a apical third. And most of the time, what happens is when we do the root canal treatment without magnification, we won't be able to see the bifurcation and there can be failure. Let's see a clinical case. This case was actually reported to me for retrieval of this small file that is at the apex. Uh, tooth was symptomatic. So I had removed the gutta perca and finally I removed the file. And when I put the working length, you can see the file tip is moving towards one side of the root tip. Now this uh, particular picture will demonstrate that if you the file is moving to this side, there is always a canal on the other side. So I had spent probably around 15, 20 minutes and this is after observation. You can see there is a trifurcation there. Obviously, don't think the third one, this one, I an instrument. This happened to this I happened to see after the observation. Probably because of my irrigation team is what had been what had made this particular canal clean and later it is being filled with a mixture of sealer and obturating material. Now, if anyone would me and uh, my team, uh, my friend Denzel was an author, is an author and my HOD uh, Vail Murian sir also is a part of this uh, review. You can freely access this article from my research gate profile. You can search my name, Jojo Koto in Google and my research gate profile will be there. You can freely download that from my uh, research gate profile. Now, recently, there had been uh, some research that, was that is focusing on radicular groove accessory root canal morphology. Now, this is something new as far as I am concerned, because uh, before 2000, this anatomical uh, anatomy is not well known in the endodontic literature, that is radicular groove. Now, what, does, what they had found in this article is that uh, lower premolars have something called a radicular groove. Now, inside the radicular groove, there is an accessory canal. That's what they found. So this is probably one of the reasons why the lower molar have a higher failure rate than the rest of the teeth. Now, another question that uh, we need to address is, will incomplete filling of primary root canal affect the treatment outcome? Now, the answer to that is obviously yes, it is going to affect the treatment outcome if it's a primary canal. Now, which is the most common uh, missed primary canal? Obviously, I hope all will agree with me, that is the MB2. Now, in olden days, probably in 1990s or 1995, MB2 is not considered as a primary canal because once you get three canal, we will obturate. But now MB2 is not considered as a secondary canal, but instead it is considered as a primary canal. Almost 90% of the cases, what I do in my clinical practice, have an MB2 canal. So this is something that we generally miss uh, in our routine endodontic treatment. Now, if you look in another aspect of this so-called MB2, 
the MB2 has been designated in various ways throughout the literature. For example, some people will call it mesopalatal, some may call it MB2, some may call it mesolingual, or some may call it second mesiobuccal. And there are uh, citations to say that this second MB2 canal has been also called as uh, the middle central canal also. So to, to rectify this ambiguity in the designation of this MB2 canal, myself and uh, my friend, Dr. Denzel, along with our HOD, Vail Murian sir, had put forth an anatomically based nomenclature to designate root canal orifices for mandibular molars and mandib maxillary molars. Again, you can uh, freely download these articles from my research gate profile. I uh, highly insist all postgraduate students to read this article and to, to improve their knowledge on root canal anatomy. Now, I'm a big fan of understanding the subject rather than knowing it. So the biggest question that we need to know and uh, highlight is why there is MB1, MB2 and MB3. To answer that question, let me take you to this picture wherein uh, it is a cross-section image of maxillary molar. You can see the palatal root here, the distobuccal root and the mesiobuccal root here. Now, if you look very carefully to the mesiobuccal root, you can see mesiobuccal root is very much elongated buccopalatally. You can see here, it's, it's very broad, okay? Compared to distobuccal, it is conical. Now, this is why distobuccal root always have a single canal because distobuccal root is conical, whereas mesiobuccal root is flattened and that is why we get MB1, MB2 and MB3. Now, very rarely, sometimes the distobuccal root also can be broader. So that's where you get the DB2 and DB3. So if you look very carefully into my case, that is the eight root canal case, you can see the distobuccal root. This is the mesiobuccal, this is the distobuccal, and this is the palatal. You can see the distobuccal root also in cross section was really broad. This is a CBCT axial image. And that could be one of the reasons why I could able to get three distal root canal orifices, which generally we don't get in, uh, in majority of the cases. Okay. So uh, again, this also I have to highlight that is uh, many uh, and, and around this postgraduates and clinicians used to take CBCT to understand the root canal anatomy. Now, uh, there are position statements from various associations to judicially use the CBCT. Now, CBCT can be used in complex cases like this, but a routine uh, practice of uh, CBCT for, as a preoperative image will drastically improve the effective radiation dosage for the pa patient. So the, all these uh, things had been addressed in this article, that is an observation and insight about potential and arbitrary use of inconsistent use of CBCT imaging. You can also get this article in research gate profile. Please uh, go and uh, read this article also. This eight canal case also had been uh, came as the cover image in Journal of Endodontics 2011 issue. Now coming to the primary canals, let's discuss few cases. Here you can see a, a a maxillary molar, well obturated, not on the distobuccal root, but you can see the mesiobuccal root. It is uh, radiographically obturation looks fine, but you can see a periapical lesion here. Now, in this case, I had removed the gutta perca first from all the three canals, and uh, while looking into the mesiobuccal, you can see this is the mesiobuccal canal. I could see a split inside the root canal, that is the MB1 here and the MB2 or palatomesia buffer here. This is at the highest magnification, so you can see the split again here, and this is the post of radiograph. So if you look in the post of radiograph, you can see that split at the apical one third. Now, why I put this x-ray is that don't think MB2 comes like a separate canal from the orifice to the uh, apex. It can start as a bifurcation also, somewhere at the middle third and apical third. 
Let's see this case. Here, this patient was reported to me because of uh, severe pain in relation to root canal treated maxillary molar. If you look into the picture, you can see uh, the mesial buccal root is obturated till three four. Palatal also is short. The pal the distal buccal is okay, I would say. So this is the pre-op image. They had done a post endrontic filling. This is a miracle mix, and they have tried to re-enter the axis and uh, try to locate the mesial buccal two canal because from the pre-op radiograph they understood the mesial buccal two might have been missed. You can see the big lesion also in relation to the mesial buccal root. So this is after the removal of post endrontic filling. You can see little uh, secondary decay here. These are the primary canal, mesial buccal, distal buccal, and palatal here. Can you see this round color thing here? These are the burr marks. Burr marks means the clinician might have tried locating the MB2 here with the, with the burr. So they tried here, here, and here, but they couldn't find any MB2 there. Now, when I looked at the highest magnification, I could see some bleeding point at this region. And when I put a file, it just went there. That is the MB2, which was highly inflamed. It was a patent single MB2 canal. And that was not obturated. And that's why the lesion had developed at the mesial, uh, towards the tip of the mesial buccal root. So this is after cleaning and shaping, I built up the proximal wall. And this is after obturation. And this is the post x -ray. You can see the MB1 and MB2 are separate canals. Now, most of the time, the MB1 and MB2 merge together. Almost 70% of the case, these two merges. That is why many a time we escape. Even if you don't fill the MB2, there won't be much problem. But 30% of the cases will be like this. That is, they have a separate MB1 and MB2. I was fortunate enough to be a part of a worldwide CGCT project on MB2 canal. And according to our finding, India reported almost 60% of MB2. This cannot be seen properly here. Okay. So I hope you can say this. 60% yeah. of MB2. Now let's move on to the second uh, factor that influence the complexity of root canal, that is the accessory canal and the lateral canal. Now, what are accessory canal and lateral canal? An accessory canal is any canal that is perpendicular to the primary canal, but located at the apical one third. Whereas lateral canal is any canal, again, which runs perpendicular to the primary canal, but not at the apical one third. And there is something called a focal canal also, which is being seen histologically. Now, these are the post-op radiograph of few of my case. You can see a lateral canal here and an accessory canal here. And uh, in first time I had seen a furcal canal. Uh, I never had encountered a furcal canal be before. I had seen histological image of it, but I had never seen it. This is a case uh, had been sent for re-RCT for me. I'm not going into detail of that case, but here I got a canal. I thought it is MB2, but when I uh, took the working length with the apex locator, this was going hardly 2 mm. So I obturated at that point, and this is the post of radiograph, where in here you can see that furcal canal. It's just from here to here. So the first time I got an, a furcal canal, but uh, I would say many of my friends have got a lot of furcal canals. And those are not actually furcal canals, those are true perforations. So you can call them as a furcal canal. Uh, maybe to tell the patient, I got a furcal canal, we can fill it with MTA. That's a better way of communicating to the patient rather than telling I had perforated uh, the tooth. So the third one, again, to third factor, which include the com it's which can help in uh, exaggerating the complexity of root canal is the apical delta. Now, what are apical delta? Apical delta is nothing but the primary canals, which is this one, will branch into n number of canals at the apical one third. This is called the apical delta. Now, this happens at the apical one third, that is three mm from the tip. 
This is the rationally why when you do epistectomy, we insist on removing 3 mm from the tip because we are removing all the apical delta. So the question is, is it possible to obturate these apical delta? Let me show you an example. This is a, a third molar pre-op image. Uh, this is after the obturation. So you can see it's a two dimensional image. You can see the apical delta had been filled properly after the obturation. Now, don't think that all of my root canal treatment post of image comes like this. Okay, be a realistic person. Many a times uh, what people does is only good root canals will be shown in the presentation and in Facebook. So don't think all my root canal post-op radiograph comes like this. Maybe I would say around 50, 60% of cases, I could able to fill the lateral canals and anastomosis, but not in all. And I think that is, that is what is being followed worldwide, to be honest, and that, that aspect. So another question that we need to address is, do filling of lateral and accessory canals change the treatment outcome? Because there is a lot of hype on this lateral canal. Do we need to fill the lateral canal? So let's discuss with few of the cases. So this is a, a tooth number one six came for re-root canal treatment. If you look at the palatal root, you can see there is a lesion towards the mesial aspect and not at the tip of the uh, palatal root. And this is a post of image. You can see there is a small lateral canal or I would say a bifurcation towards this side and that is the reason why there is a lesion in the lateral root. Now, the question which I would like to ask all of you is, if I didn't fill this branching, will the treatment will be successful? No, it won't be. Let's see another case. Here also you can see same, something similar to the previous case, the palatal root. You can see a lateral lesion here. And this is after the obturation. You can see again a lateral canal or accessory canal, I would say, because it's the apical one third towards the lesion. So the take home message about this is, uh, do we need to fill the lateral canal in all case? No, there is no need to fill all the lateral canals, but it is significant in highly infected cases or cases which have huge lesion at the apical one third. So, I would highly insist to fill these lateral canals, especially if you are working on a tooth with necrotic uh, pulp and the tooth should have a periapic lesion or else filling of lateral canal is not going to make much difference in your clinical practice. The third is the isthmus. What do you mean by isthmus? Isthmus is a connection between two primary canals. You can see it here, okay? The most commonly seen isthmus is on the mesial root of mandibular first molar. There is a connection between these two. And this connection, that is this system is, when you put a file here, that is here, you get a middle mesial canal, this one. The middle mesial canal as such, there is nothing called middle mesial canal. Very rarely you get a middle mesial canal. But most of the time, what we get in our clinical practice is when you put a K file here, it goes through the isthmus, you enlarge it with rotary, you get a beautiful round canal and that we call it as middle mesial canal, which can join either of the mesial buccal and mesial lingual or probably it can have a separate exit. Another thing that we all should remember is something called C-shaped canal. I want all of you to read about the type or classification of C-shaped canal. This is a min et al classification. There are a lot of other classification for C-shape by fan et al, by uh, the Melton et al. So these are other classification for C-shaped canal. Let's see a few of the cases. You can see a second molar almost obturated well here and with a big lesion, okay? So you can, I, from the radiograph, we can see that these are single cone obturation. That is with the rotary, you obturate with a single cone uh, GP. Now there is a lesion here. So I started the case, this was a C-shaped canal and I filled it with three-dimensional filling and this is after the obturation. You can see the GP and the sealer had penetrated all the way into the isthmus that is connecting the primary canals which makes the C-shape. This is a follow-up radiograph 
probably after an year, you can see the healing has been initiated. This is another case. You can see again uh, a single cone observation, huge lesion at the periapex. This is uh, during my treatment, I got only two canals. This is something like a minetal classification. You should go through and go through that article by minetal. Beautiful classification he has given for uh, differentiating she canals uh, clinically. And uh, this is the post of radiograph. You can see the C had initiated at the apical one third. I'm sure this uh, treatment will be effective in tackling the periapical lesion. Again, I was a part of a worldwide prevalence study on C-shaped anatomy and India accounts to around 13% of C-shaped anatomy in mandibular second molar. So all of you should watch out for C-shaped canal whenever you are dealing with mandibular second molar. The fifth is a curvature. So I'm not going into detail of curvatures as you can see in this picture, but what I would like to tell you is something called a bionate curvature. What do you mean by that? If you look into the pre-op radiograph here, you can see the lesion is more towards the distal aspect of the distal root. It is not at the center, it is more distally. So I was thinking before the treatment, why the lesion is more towards the lateral aspect or distal to the distal root canal or root. Now this I understood after taking the working length and patency. You can see the file had curved abruptly at the, probably at the apical one third. Now, when I took the file out and see it uh, under the microscope, uh, you can see it is having almost a 70 degree curvature. But when I looked at three dimensionally, that is I rotated the file, you can also see how it looks. It is not uh, rotated in, curved in one direction. Instead, you can see it is, it is uh, being curved in multiple directions. Okay, so these uh, curvatures are called bionite curvatures. It's very tricky. It's very difficult to instrument and observe these canals. Uh, so you should be aware about such curvatures that are multi-directional curvatures that is common in the mandibular molars and maxillary molars. And this is the post of radiograph. I could able to get some accessory canal and lateral canal here also. The sixth is the developmental anomaly. Uh, if I can list out a few of the development anomaly, I can say dense invagination, palatogenic groove, I can say talentcus, uh, and uh, torodontism. All these are development anomalies. I'm not, I have a lot of case of all these, but because of the time shortage, I'm limiting to one case. So this case was referred to me by a general dentist. He said that when I initiated the RCT, I am not able to get the pulp chamber flow and I am getting a lot of uncontrolled bleeding. This is the radiograph I took when the patient came to me. So already access opened. You can see a lot of uh, temporary filling here. So when I opened up this case under rubber dam, I could see bleeding as, uh, refer, as said by the referring dentist. Later under highest magnification, I could see MB1 and MB2 at the apex, distobuckle and palatal. And this is after the observation, you can see like a four finger, it is branching at the apical one third and this is after observation. This is actually a hyperthorodontism. Now what happened here is the general dentist is not aware about something called thorodontism. So when, they op when he opened up the uh, axis, he couldn't find any pulpal floor. So he believed that the, he had removed the pulpal floor and perforated it. So this highlights the importance of knowing the anatomy if you're doing root canal treatment. Seventh is the flattened canals. Now, uh, my teacher Gobi sir always say, uh, many people think the distal canals in mandibular molar is very easy to clean and shape. But to be honest, distal canal is very difficult to clean and shape because there is a lot of chuck of pulp tissue there and it is not easy to remove all the uh, pulp tissue from the distal canals because distal canal is not round. It is oval in shape, but our rotary files are round. So distal canal of mandibular molar will look like this. It is not round in shape and probably maxillary molar premolars, second premolars also have a flattened canal. 
it is a big challenge to uh, fill, clean, and shape the flattened canals like this. So all of you should give some effort in understanding something called flattening can the flattened canal and how to properly clean, shape, and fill these flattened canals. The eighth one, the last one in making the complexity of root canal system is the dentinal tubules. Now there is a lot of research happening in dentinal tubules now. You know why? Because it is said that the bacteria can colonize around 200 to 400 micrometer into the dentinal tubules. This is an image, a histological image, high magnification image, and these are dentinal tubules. And you can see the bacteria all the way till here. And the distance from here to here is around 400 micrometer. So actually, if there is a highly virulent bacteria, these bacteria can go and hide into the dendinal tubules. Now, I had listed out uh, the factors that makes the root canal anatomy complex, the eight factors. I had also mentioned what makes, what makes root canal system dynamic. Now let's move on to the second part of the presentation, that is, this dynamic and complex root canal anatomy, how it is going to influence various steps of root canal treatment from preoperatory buildup to retreatment. I'm going very briefly with some clinical image because I don't have much time. Already we are running short of time. First is the impact of pre of post endodontic buildup or pre post endodontic buildup on for root canal treatment. So uh, this is what I would like to say all of you, that is identify the position of primary root canal orifice physically and mentally before pre-endodontic buildup. This is especially uh, valid when you have a proximal decay. Many a time what happens is, if you have a proximal decay, you remove the decay and try to fill that proximal box with composite this, there is high chance the composite will occlude some of the primary canal and you will find it really difficult to get into that canal at a later point of time. Now let's uh, discuss a case. So this case was referred to me by an endodontist. Now uh, she had uh, done a root canal treatment or tooth number six and seven and she couldn't be able to find the mesio buckle because it is sorry distal buckle because it is calcified also she couldn't find the palatal because this is calcified she had informed the patient that she couldn't be able to find these two root canals and with patient consent she had filled it with the permanent filling and probably had given a fritz now what happened after some time maybe after two three months the patient is having swelling and pain from the tooth and that is why the patient was referred to me. So when I took the radiograph, I could see, as she had mentioned, the distal buccal canal is calcified, not obturated. Palatal also is not uh, obturated well. But what is disturbing for me is the extent of the post endodontic filling. You can see it here. It is too deep, okay? And this is, uh, I tried to initiate the retreatment it, is, it was very difficult to initiate the retreatment because many a times uh, when I do retreatment, uh, the moment I remove the crown, I could see temporary filling. I don't know why people are uh, in love with the temporary filling. I couldn't find a permanent filling under the crown. So this makes my job much easier. It's very easy to remove the temporary filling and find the orifice. But here she had done a good permanent filling all the way to the pulp chamber floor. So I really find it difficult to differentiate composite with the dentine. And finally, I could able to remove all the orifice. And this is what I found. You can see the mesial buccal orifice which is here. The distal buccal is not filled. Palatal also is not filled in the first molar. And there is some sealer uh, at, uh, concentration here, here and here, which I assume it is a perforation. But if you look very carefully into this image, you can see still some composite here. Can you see that? Now, what I assume is this tooth, if you look, go back to the pre-op image, there could have been a disto occlusal decay here 
and she had done a post endodontic filling here and then started with the RCT. And this post endodontic filling might have occluded the distal buccal canal. And this post endodontic filling is what we see here. Can you see that? So what I had done is I selectively removed this composite filling and I could able to get into the distal buccal canal. I could able to get into the palatal also. It was difficult. See, I can, I'm using a pathfinder file here to negotiate the calcified canal. In addition, I'm able to get an MB2 also here. So this is after observation, you can see MB1, MB2, distal buccal and palatal is not uh, seen in this radiograph. Now these three are micro perforation, one, two and three. These are burr marks. She was trying to locate these canals and uh, without magnification, when you do with uh, burr, you can see these burr indentation here, which uh, is a micro perforation. So I repaired that area with MTA. So that becomes seven canals, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven is the palatal. So I posted in Facebook this picture and I said seven root canal system. And many, there are many people who comment like, comments like, wow, sir, great job, without realizing that three canals are artificial canals. So here, this also highlights the importance of knowing the anatomy. But very few had commented like, why three of the canals are white in color and three are black, orange in color. So that highlights the importance of knowing the anatomy, especially when you are doing the post endodontic filling. This is a uh, post endo x-ray after my treatment. You can see MB1, MB2 merge here and this is the palatal and this is the distal buccal canal. Now let's move on to the second factor that is the impact of access opening. Okay, so access opening is the first to step towards root canal treatment. Now this is something which I give a lot of importance whenever I do retreatment I always modify the axis. The first thing which I will do, will, I'll be doing is modify the axis because axis is something that many people ignore while doing root canal treatment. They don't refine the axis cavity and effectively that is the nidus to create all these complications during the further procedures of root canal treatment. Now you can see here, this is a re-root re canal treatment which I was about to initiate now, before initiating the uh, re root canal treatment, I have modified the axis like this. Now you can see the tooth is smiling. I can assume that way. That is because once I had done the axis properly, the tooth become happy because I had done the axis well. So what I'm trying to tell you in this picture is that always stress upon axis. Axis is success. Axis is a path towards all the other step of endodontics. Now there are a lot of uh, controversies in access in the modern era, like uh, means access, uh, caries driven access, contracted access and all those things. And uh, you can see, uh, I got uh, an image, a micro CT image, with like a single, uh, single uh, rooted molar with two canals, which is merging at the middle third. So if you look here, this molar also looks something similar to that. This is an intentional root canal treatment. So I had done with a minimal axis cavity. The, the width of this axis cavity is probably around two to three millimeter. And this is the post of radiograph. And you can see the soffit is being preserved here. These are called the soffit preservation axis. Now there is something called caries driven axis also. Look at this image. You have a root caries towards the distal aspect. You have an amalgam filling towards the mesial, secondary decay. So this is a clinical image. This is a, uh, uh, the, the root caries towards the palatal root. This is the mesial amalgam with secondary decay. So I removed the amalgam filling and the decay from the palatal root. And if you look very carefully, you can see the concavity of the root canal, or external root. Can you see that? It is very difficult to fill this because it's not impossible to fill uh, this concavity with a matrix system, irrespective of the matrix. Even if you use a bioclear matrix, which is not 
it is not possible to fill it with a matrix. So finally, with my own customized technique, I could able to build that wall and I found MB1, MB2 and distal buckle from this area and palatal to this area. So these, these, this axis cavity is called the caries driven axis. Why it is called caries driven? Because I, had, I hadn't opened up the tooth like a routine axis. axis. Instead, wherever I removed the tooth structure for, uh, because, uh, because of the caries, through that area, I found the, all the root canal system. So this is after the post endodontic filling. Now, all of you, please listen to it very carefully. Now, what happened, is, what happened here is this is where the original tooth structure is preserved, okay? This is the, where the amalgam was there. This is also involved in decay. So this yellowish portion is where the original tooth structure remaining. So this is that area. Now, if you do a conventional axis like this, you will remove tooth structure all the way from into this portion. So effectively, you will remove all the tooth structure which is remaining. And uh, when you do a crown preparation later, you can see it, you will reduce <clears throat> 2 mm all around, right? So there is hardly anything that is left out for the tooth to survive. So this is the importance of caries driven access cavity. This is the post of radiograph of that case. <clears throat> Again, another case of soffit preservation access, a very limited access, and this is the post of radiograph. Now, what I would like to tell all of you as a take home message on access cavity is stick on to the conventional access, but don't be too conservative. At the same time, do not be too conventional. Make sure you have a decently cons conservative access cavity so that our primary aim is to fill clean the entire root canal system. Okay. So I'm not a big fan of this ninja access or contracted access. You can try this if you have good knowledge on root canal anatomy. The third is the impact of apical limit or working length. So if you look into this histological image, you can see here, this is a major diameter. This is a minor diameter. This is called the dentinal canal and this is the cemental canal because the cementum will invaginate here. The cementum will invaginate into the root canal system and the meeting point of, point of cementum to the dentin, we generally call it a minor diameter. So this is a cemental canal. This is a dentinal canal. So in root canal system, we have two objectives. One is mechanical, the other is biological. Now, if you maintain the working length till here, we, maintain, we had satisfied the mechanical objective. But what about this biological objective? Do, don't you think there will be bacteria between the minor and major diameter that is in the cemental canal? So if you really would like to remove all the bacteria and satisfy the biological objective, you need to clean this area also. So there's a big debate on the working length, to be honest, whether to terminate it here or here. That is, that is why we generally take patency. When you take patency, we are indirectly cleaning this area. So I'm not again going into much detail about this controversial topic, that is uh, working length, at what, uh, what length you should actually stop, whether it is minor diameter or major diameter, or probably much above all these all these parameters. But I would say that there are evidence to suggest that presence of bacteria in the cemental canal is in cases of necrotic pulps with periapical lesion is one of the reasons why a well root canal obturated tooth will have a persisting post endodontic lesion. This is one of the reasons that has been highlighted. The fourth is the impact of working width. I hope everyone is aware about the, the working width. Man, many of us are bothered about working length. We are not bothered much about the working width. Now there are various techniques to find the working width of a, of a root canal like dentinal fillings collected in the instrument. You can look into those. The, uh, the, irrigating solution, you, you make sure it is clean, you, then you can assume 
uh, that uh, the working width is being satisfied, tactile feel, uh, preparation size based on the mean apical diameter, and you enlarge three or four times than the first file that binds to the apex. But it is clearly mentioned in the literature that if you increase the file size, that is the working width, if you increase the working width, you get a better treatment outcome. There are contrary studies to that, but in general, I can say this is valid for necrotic tooth with periapic lesion. You enlarge more, you get a better treatment outcome. Now, if anyone would like to know more about working with its and its current status, please go through this article of mine, which is published in Restorative Dentistry and Endodontology in 2005, that is working with a deserted aspect in endodontics. I have discussed the past, present, and the future for working with determination. Okay, so moving on, uh, this is a clinical image of that. This patient had done root canal treatment long back. There is a huge uh, lesion which is not appreciated in this radiograph, but you can see it here. What happened here is the working length is fine. You can see here, but the working width is not properly addressed and that is what I had done. Even though I don't know whether you can see it, I had enlarged the canal more and after a week, patient said they are doing good. Fifth is the impact on shaping. Now, if you look into the rotary file, it is being introduced in the market in 1990. When it was introduced, everyone thought this is a silver bullet that is going to revolutionize the treatment outcome. But in reality, what rotary file does is it produces only round shapes like this. Can you see that round shape? It doesn't incorporate there complexity of the root canal system. And this is more prevalent, pre prevalent when the complexity increases from left to right. It is impossible to clean all the clean and shape all the root canal system when you have a complex case like this. Now, how to address it? The first file that came in the market to address the three-dimensional shape of uh, root canal system is the SAF or self-adjusting file. There are two more in the market right now. That is a true shape from Densefly and the XP end of finisher and shaper from FKG. So you can go through this uh, file system and just make yourself uh, understand that what difference these file is going to make in shaping uh, compared with the conventional file system. The sixth is the impact of intracanal medicaments. Okay. Now, if you look uh, carefully into literature, this is a statement that is uh, that every one of us will agree. That is, the success rate of RCT of teeth with apical periodontitis is 10 to 25 percent lower than teeth with not detectable disease. That you can see it here, right? So why is that? Why what happened? Uh, this, what, what, why there is reduced success rate on a uh, tooth with periapical lesion? That is because of the biofilm. You can see the biofilm inside the primary canal. You can see biofilm inside the isthmus, and you can see it into the lateral canal also. And even into the dentinal tubules, you can see into the dentinal tubules, there is biofilm. So this uh, can be tackled with irrigation if you, are, if you are doing it properly. But very various fluid dynamic studies have shown that when, it go, when you activate the irrigant, this is a primary canal, and when you activate the irrigant with uh, some sort of ultrasonics, the irrigant will go around 2.5 micrometer into the dentinal tubules. Now in the previous slide I had mentioned the bacteria may enter 200 to 300 micrometer, but irrigant is not good enough to enter all the way to the 200 and 300 micrometer, and that is why intracanal medicaments are important. So I would highly in, insist all of you to put some intracanal medicament. I don't mind what you use from chlorhexidine to MCAT, anything you can use, but it is better to put intracanal medicament if you are doing a conventional endodontic. Now this doesn't matter if you're doing an advanced endodontic because irrigant is good enough to clean everything. But if you are going with your routine endodontic that is conventional without magnification, without rapidam, 
it is better to put intracanal medicament inside the root canal system. Seventh is impact of irrigation. Now, irrigation is one of my favorite topic. I'm not uh, again going into detail of it. If you would like to know about irrigation, I had done an online webinar, a Facebook live on irrigation. You can go into my Facebook page, Root Canal Point, and there you can find a video of my presentation on an evidence-based discussion on endodontic irrigation. But just to summarize, I can say that the, 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 the area where we should concentrate is the apical one third here. This is where irrigant should act, not anywhere else. Because at the middle third, the file will take care and the coronal third, the burr will take care. Where irrigant should reach is the apical one third. And I can conclude uh, the, this factor by this slide, that is where file cannot reach, the irrigants can reach. So where file cannot reach, file cannot reach the accessory canals, the anastomosis, fins and all those things. So there, probably irrigant will clean and uh, disinfect those uh, inaccessible areas. Eight is the impact of three-dimensional filling. So when I'm talking about three-dimensional filling, I should speak about Shielder. He is a one who had invented warm vertical compaction. Now, according to him, he said that you, we need to fill the entire root canal system rather than just the primary canals. Now, the big question is, how will you clean the entire root canal system? You can clean it, but how will you obturate it? So the answer lies into this simple fact. Again, I'm going to irrigation. You can clean and shape the primary canals with the files, but no files will enter the accessory canal and lateral canal. And into the lateral canal and accessory canal, only one thing will reach, which I had mentioned before, that is the irrigation. So that if you in irrigate with proper time and technique, this irrigant will digest the entire content into the, in the root canal system. And then we do a warm vertical compaction. You get a beautiful image like this, what I have got. You can see a lot of accessory canals, lateral canals, and stomosis have been filled. Don't think I had put a file here. No one is able to put a file into this canal lateral canal or axillary canal. You can do something called scouting, but these are uh, probably guesswork. You won't be able to do it perfectly. But what really uh, makes uh, these uh, filling proper is the judicial use of irrigants. Coming to the last part, that is the impact of retreatment on root canal anatomy. So let's discuss this case. This patient had reported to me uh, because uh, she had uh, then initiated a root canal treatment with uh, a general dentist and later she had intolerable pain and was uh, referred to me. So if you look, the, the, mesio, the distal buckle is calcified, but what is disturbing again for me is the extent of the access opening. You can see access opening has gone all the way till here. So I am suspecting a perforation here. There is secondary decay here. So this is a clinical image. The palatal cusp is not there. It has been fractured because of huge restoration and secondary decay here. So I had done a crown lengthening and took the isolation and built the tooth. And then I removed the temporary. I could see perforation here and here, which I repaired with MTA. Later, I found the mesial buckle, distal buckle and palatal. And this is after filling, and this is after post of radical. This is a post of radical. Now, what I'm going to tell you in this is that we all should, uh, again, uh, give a lot of importance to anatomy. Why this general dentist had done a mistake is he, the general dentist doesn't have any idea where the pulp chamber floor is ending. That is why he had gone too much into the pulp chamber and ended up in perforation here. So the anatomy is a core or the important factor which influence all aspects of root canal treatment. Here you can see another case, a, 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 a central incisor fully calcified with a periapical lesion. 
So this case, I, I find it, I found uh, with weight, great difficulty. I had gone all the way to the middle third. You can see in the radiograph here, I, I had gone all the way to the middle third and then I got the nick and to the canal and took the working length and the post of radiograph. So this, how I have, I gone till here, there are various techniques to that. We had to use magnification. Obviously the knowledge on root canal anatomy should be there and you have to use specialized instruments called ultrasonic Munzberg and all. So there is a video that I'm gonna show. that file out There's some problem. Okay. Um, let's move on with the next uh, uh, clinical case. This is the last one which I'm going to show here. You can see uh, this is a canine. Uh, active orthodontic treatment is going on. There is something called internal cervical resorption here and internal cervical resorption also is going on here. So probably I can say this is a combination of internal resorption and external cervical resorption. So this is the external cervical resorption. This is the internal resorption. We can also interpret like it is a grade four uh, external cervical resorption. This is the external cervical resorption that can encroach the pulp chamber. So we are not sure about this. So what I had done first is I had tackled the external cervical resorption, took the isolation and filled it. The external cervical resorption is being tackled. Later, I opened up the canal. And uh, if you look into the pre-op radiograph of this case, you can see there is a fractured file also. So what the uh, general dentist had informed is when he had done the root canal treatment, there was uncontrolled bleeding, okay? So moving on, when I took the access opening, removed all the gutta perca and everything, I could see two opening here. Now what happened here is actually these are not canals, instead these are perforation. Because, because of the internal resorption, the dentin becomes so thin and the general dentist had put the orify shaper here and that had ended up in a perforation there. And that is why there is uncontrolled bleeding. Later, I removed that small file. I can see the file here. I removed it. I filled it with uh, thermoplastic obturation. And this perforation is being repaired with the MPA. And this is the post of radio. Again, I'm trying to tell all of you the importance of anatomy. This is a very complex case. I could able to tackle only because I know what to expect during the treatment. So coming to the conclusion, I would say this is the work or change in uh, the work, change in perception. When I was a postgraduate student long back, a decade back in 2009, we were more bothered about finding root canal orifice. Okay. 
So I got eight root canal orifice on a maxillary molar and you can see the post of radiograph here. But now we are more bothered about the apical exiting foramen. This is a case that I got last year, a decade after the eight root canal system case, I got four canals. You can see one, two, three, and four. But after obturation, you can see mesio buccal root. I have one, two, three, four, and five. Palatal root, I have one, two, and three, and distal, I have one. So we can call this as nine root canal system. So this is a change in vogue. That is, I'm, we are not uh, bothered much about finding all the orifice, but what uh, really gives better treatment outcome is how good you obturate the apical portion. So even I had changed my perception from 2010 to 2020, I'm more concentrating on the apical one third because I know or I understood that that's where the success of root canal is uh, put up. So to conclude, I could say this is an uh, again an article which is published uh, by me and my friend, published in Restorative Industry and Endonics. And if you look, read this article, you can see that one of the important factor which influence the treatment outcome is the root canal anatomy. You can see here. So if you are not good in the understanding the root canal anatomy, obviously you will end up in a bad treatment. So coming into the conclusion, I can say that root canal anatomy is complex and dynamic, which I hope all of you had understood with this presentation. And this is a factor that is a root canal anatomy is the only factor which influence all these, starting from working length, access opening, obturation, restoration, instrumentation, biofilling, everything revolves around root canal anatomy. And without properly understanding root canal anatomy, any research that is happening in any of these will be incomplete. So I was fortunate to be a part of this great team. Uh, uh, we had published an textbooks exclusively for root canal anatomy. It is called root canal anatomy in permanent dentition. It published last year by Springer Publication. So I also uh, uh, contributed to this uh, book. So that is something that's to be proud of. And I want all of you to, if possible, to read this uh, book. This gives in and out everything about root canal anatomy. So that's from my part. I would like to acknowledge uh, all my teachers, which I generally do after all my presentation. What I'm today is because of my teacher. So I would like to especially thank all my teachers, especially Vail sir, Gopi sir and all others. And also extending my thanks to my wonderful batchmates. Uh, we were six. This picture was taken on the last day of my post-graduation. Uh, you can see Denzil here. This is Anu, uh, Anu, Susmita and Tonal. We had a wonderful team. And uh, I would like to extend my thanks to my batchmates also. So that's uh, it from my side. Uh, I know I had exceeded my time, but uh, I tried my level best to incorporate both theory and pra practical here. Um, if you would like to know anything much uh, more about this particular topic, you can contact me in any of these modules. Uh, you can email me or there is a Facebook page called Root Canal Point. You can search there and uh, you can uh, give me a message. I'll be happy to help you on any of your queries related to the topic. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks to Mittal sir for the invitation. And uh, that's it. Over to the uh, administrative section. Thanks, Dr. Jojo. That was a that was a wonderful and a very informative session. Uh, now, before we move on to question and answer session, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Padma Bhushan Brigadier Dr. Anil Kohli sir who has always been there for all our webinars and has been a big source of encouragement. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Dr. S. Balagopal, Professor, Dr. Rupa Nadek, ma'am, Dr. Vanita Nikhil, ma'am, and all of our professors and teachers who have taken time out of their precious schedule to join us for this webinar. Uh, now, I would like to hand over you. Surely, you have a lot of questions waiting for you. Uh, 
now i move it on to dr vanita the moderator for today's session uh, to carry on with the question and answer session dr vanita it's over to you okay thank you sir so thank you so much dr jojo for such a marvelous presentation i must say you are a wonderful orator sir thank you for such a wonderful presentation sir first of all uh, so let's begin with the question answer round sir yeah sure go ahead i have received a lot of questions Okay, sir. So, uh, the first one, first participant wants to ask that which is the best instrument to scout the root canals and whether we can use chelating agent for the initial preparation for glide path. Mm -hmm. Okay, so answer to the first first part of the question, which is the best instrument to do the scouting of root canal. I would say again, it depends upon what uh, the the anatomy of the root canal that you are going to scout. so if you are want to scout a very curved canal i would stick on to reamers or more flexible scouting instruments reamers are more flexible uh, because uh, it will uh, negotiate the canal at a much faster pace and uh, without creating any uh, procedural errors but if you are dealing with uh, a calcified canal your scouting instrument should not be flexible instead it should be rigid something like a Uh, I would say C, uh, path files or uh, uh, C plus C plus files, C pilot files. Any of those rigid files can be used as a scouting instrument. And the second part of the question, whether we can use the chelating agent. I hope uh, you are mentioning about the EDT. Yes, we can use the chelating agent uh, for initial scouting. But uh, modern research says that. there is no need to use a separate edta gel what is more important or is to put the uh, file into a wet field so as a take home message i can say instead of taking the edta gel you can scout on a wet canal you put some irrigant into the canal and then you scout that will be better than using a gel type okay sir uh the second one wants to ask that in in case of a rotated molar what can you suggest for negotiation of canals without using microscope in case of rotation of molar i didn't in the... rotated molar in case the molar is rotated how to negotiate the canals without using any microscope okay so uh... they want some clinical tips yeah i can say the most important aspect there is to identify whether the tooth is rotated or not now this is very problematic when the tooth have a crown many a time when you do the crown we won't be able to understand whether the tooth is rotated or not so i would highly right uh, emphasize this part that is the moment you do retreatment if the crown cutting was not done by you it is better to remove the crown so that you get a good anatomy good knowledge about whether the tooth is rotated tilted and all and uh, what i generally do in locating these difficult case is to look into the floor wall junction the floor wall junction is the key that holds the color change so the canals are located on the floor wall junction probably towards the corner you follow the crasher and run for low uh, whether the the tooth is rotated or tilted you can get into the canal okay sir so the next question i have received from number of participants that which obturation method which obturation method i follow to fill the lateral canals <laughs> there is no special technique to fill the lateral canal i told you filling of lateral canal primarily uh, deals with the irrigation protocol that we follow Okay, there is some, some importance to be given for the scouting, but I would say eighty percent of scouting, you would like to do the lateral canal. You have to concentrate more on irrigation because wherever files cannot reach, irrigants can reach. It is impossible to put the file into the root canal, into the lateral canal, because it is perpendicular to the primary canal. So I would highly suggest to improve your irrigation strategy. And follow some three-dimensional filling method in order to get to the lateral. Okay, sir. So 
Okay, sir. Uh, the next one wants to ask how to manage the bionet curvatures. Bionet curvatures are really difficult to, uh, I mean, tackle. You know why? Because we have multi-directional curvature. So you should be very careful in putting the rotten shape in the back. You can put, but lesser paper file. That's a good. So whenever I find bionet curvatures, I put less paper files, probably 2% of 4%. And that should be a fresh file. And make sure you create a gap card. Try to mimic the bionet curvature on the number 10, 15 files. Create a super loose bike card. And then you put a lesser paper file. Uh, or else you can use a control memory files like Protaper Gold or Hyflex. These are also good in tackling the dynamic curve. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next one wants to ask should isthmus be instrumented or not? Uh, again, that's a controversial topic. If you, have, if you are dealing with the isthmus, I would also, what I do in my practice is I don't instrument the isthmus, rather, I will open up the isthmus. Why? What's the difference? If you instrument the isthmus, there is high chance of per strip perforation because sometimes isthmus is the area where there is very thin. So, there is high chance you end up in strip perforation. So, what I would like to tell as a take home message or, or I do in my clinical practice. Rather than instrumenting this, I open up the instrument. I open up the instrument with ultrasonic. That will facilitate the irrigation penetration. So that will help in cleaning and shifting the instrument area. So I would say rather than instrumenting the instrument, the entire instrument, it is better to open up the instrument and facilitate the irrigation penetration. Yes, the last one is that uh, so this question so many people want to ask that which irrigation protocol or irrigation activation system uh, you use or what is your choice of system? See, I told you I have given a lecture on irrigation that is there in my Facebook page. You can go into that Facebook page that I that was a live presentation for uh, a, a group in Facebook. That's a three-hour lecture. I have a full irrigation protocol there. Three, very in detail. So if anyone would like to know more about irrigation, my irrigation protocol and the uh, irrigation with evidence, you please watch that lecture, a three-hour lecture, get a good idea about the protocols that follow worldwide, not by me, but by various other irrigations and activities. So I think that's all with the questionnaire for today, sir. Thank you so much. Thank and you. now I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Sarun to take over. Sarun, sir. Sir, are you there? Dr. Sanjay. Uh, sir, Dr. Sanjay Milani wants to say something. Sir. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, you know, I was I am driving back from college and uh, I didn't want to miss Jojo's lecture. You know, it is always a pleasure listening to him. And you always learn something, even at this age. So, thank you Jojo for, uh, you know, giving such an informative uh, lecture. And I think uh, many of us will get something or other out of this and will, it will improve their endodontic practice. Uh, at this juncture, uh, on behalf of Indian Endodontic Society, I would like to thank the Shmish Dental College for organizing these webinars. You know, there is a uh, flood of webinars, but in spite of that, uh, you always manage to have such a high attendance. And I think it is because you are uh, led by a very able person, Dr. Sodi. Uh, I have a pleasure of meeting him many times because I come to Dashmesh very frequently. And he's such a dynamic man. And... Uh, also in conservative, Dr. Mittal and Tarun, both are great friends and uh, they all have hunger for knowledge. And uh, my thanks uh, from Indian Endodontic Society to, to the Shmesh Dental College and to Jojo. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Meghani, sir. Thanks a lot.
Uh, now uh, I hand it over to our dean, Dr. Sodi, uh, for a formal vote of thanks. Sodi, sir. Sodi, sir. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Jojo. It is really a treat to listen to you. While I missed the earlier part, I was busy in some other function. But believe me, it was a treat to listen to you at a, such a young age. You have been so dynamic and I've seen a full of a positive energy and a passion to learn, teach and invent newer concepts in the endodontic treatment. God bless you, my dear Jojo. You are doing excellent in endodontics. It makes each one of us proud. Hello, I'm there? Yeah, thank you, sir. Yes, yes. 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 yes, Dr. Jojo, it's not finished, but it's for all the delegates also. And I wish to thank all the delegates across the country. They always bless us more than 100 colleges, uh, students, doctors, they join this. And I'm really thankful and, and uh, I'm sure they must have gained lots of knowledge and learning from your, uh, this very informative lectures. But I'm also thankful to our mentor, our everything, my elder brother, uh, Padma Bhushan, Padma Shri, Brigadier, former DCI President, Dr. Anil Kohli. He never misses our webinar. And we always see him. He enjoys his lunch on meeting with us. <laughs> and, and he is always there for us, for our college. And sir, we are indebted. And congratulations to you, sir, for being uh, bestowed with another a global humanitarian award by YouTube. You have been already bestowed with so many numerous awards, honors, and accolades. It has not been, you know, accountable by you only. What to talk about us? You even you can't count your records, your awards. So I pray to God that these all accords and awards keep coming to you and God always bless you with good health and happiness. God bless you and please bless us always like this. And thank, thank you, you very Sodi. much sir, for always. Thank you, Sodi. Uh, yes, let me two words for Zozo. Yes. Zozo, it's wonderful to listen to your lecture. And you know, to be honest with you, I always knew Gopi is uh, extremely wonderful and good. But I never knew Go Gopi is a student. I know Jojo are equally good. And you know, the best part of these webinars which have been organized and you know, sharing knowledge which we wanted 10, 15 years back with the different colleges, which has mm. become a reality because of the COVID-19. Yes. And uh, today you have shared the knowledge with the next generation. It is wonderful to watch. And I really pray and see you on the bigger heights. And my good wishes and my blessings to you. To thank Sodi, you, sir. Thank you. And thank all you, the fraternity. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. thank you, Dr. Miglani, for the kind words. And I have always uh, been, you know, watching you since years. You are always uh, a student, I will see, always uh, keen to uh, listen and learn. And I know you are uh, for PhD and I always try to learn. And a teacher is a best teacher when he himself is a learner, a student, because you, you only learn by teaching. So it's learning and teaching, they are symbiotic. So we can't say, you know, I only teach and so I can't attend, you know, all these lectures. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay Miglani, once again. And I thank each and everyone and especially Dr. Sunandan, Dr. Tarun, Dr. Vanita, Department of Endo for organizing such excellent webinars uh, on behalf of DSED uh, and uh, keeping everyone abreast with the knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you one and all. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Jojo. And no. accept this, uh, accept this uh, honor of gratitude, uh, which is displayed on the screen by Tarun. You have seen it. Wonderful. Thanks.
थैंक यू जोजो थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सर थैंक्स अलॉट एवरीबडी